Uh, thank you uh, for coming to my lecture this evening. I'd like you to imagine a world in which male musicians are routinely expected to act as submissive sex objects. Picture Beyonce's husband, Jay-Z, stripped down to a teaback bikini thong, sex kittening his way through a boulevard of suited and booted women for their pleasure. Or Britney Spears' ex, Justin Timberlake, in buttock-clenching denim hot pants, writhing on the bonnet of a pink Chevy, explaining to his audience how he'd like to be their teenage dream. Before we all get a little too hot beneath the gussets, of course, these scenarios are not likely to become reality, unless for comedy's sake. The reason for this is that these are roles that the music industry has carved out specifically for women. It is a male-dominated industry with a juvenile perspective on gender and sexuality. From what I can see, there are three main roles that women are allowed to fill in modern pop music, each of them restrictive for both artist and audience. They are mainly portrayed through the medium of the music video. You'll find them very familiar. I call them the one of the girls' girls, the victim stroke torch singer, and the unattainable sex bot. The one of the girls' girls' role is a painfully thin reduction of feminism that generally seems to point to a world where So long as you can hang out with your girls, it's possible to sort of wave away the evils that men do. This denigrates women and men equally, and yet is commonly lauded for being empowering. The victim stroke torch singer uh, can be divided into the sexy victim, i.e. Natalie Imbruglia in her torn video, and the not-so-sexy victim. One female artist who does not use her sexuality to sell records is Adele. However, lyrically, her songs are almost without exception written from the perspective of the wronged woman, an archetype as old as time, someone who has been let down by the men around her and is subsequently in a perpetual state of despair. But to me, the unattainable sex bot is the most commonly employed and most damaging, a role that is also often claimed to be an empowering one. The irony behind this is that the women generally filling these roles are very young, often previous child stars or Disney tweens, who are simply interested in getting along in an industry glamorised to be the most desirable career for young women. They are encouraged to present themselves as hypersexualized, unrealistic, cartoonish, as objects, reducing female sexuality to a prize you can win. When I was 19 or 20, I found myself in this position, being pressured into wearing more and more revealing outfits, And the lines I had spun at me again and again, generally by middle-aged men, were, you look great, you've got a great body, why not show it off? Or, don't worry, it'll look classy, it'll look artistic. (laughs) I felt deeply uncomfortable about the whole thing. But I was often reminded by record label executives just whose money was being spent. Whilst I can't defer all blame away from myself, I was barely out of my teenage years, And the consequence of this portrayal of me is that now I am frequently abused on social media, being called slut, whore, and a catalogue of other indignities that I'm sure you're also sadly very familiar with. Now I find it difficult to promote my music in the places where it would be best suited because of my history. The culture of demeaning women in pop music is so ingrained as to become routine, from the way we are dealt with by management and labels to the way we are presented to the public. You could trace this back to Madonna, although it probably does go back further in time. But she was a template setter. By changing her image regularly, putting her sexuality in the heart of her image, videos and live performance, the statement she was making was, I'm in control of me and my sexuality. This idea has had its corners rounded off over the years and has become, take your clothes off, show you're an adult. Rihanna's recent video for Pour It Up may have over 40 million hits on YouTube, but you only have to look at the online response to see that it is only a matter of time before the public turn on an artist for pushing it too far. But the single, like all of Rihanna's other provocative hits, will make her male writers and producers and record label guys a ton of money. It is a multi-billion dollar business that relies upon short burst messaging to sell product. And there is no easier way to sell something than to get some chick to get her tits out, right? (laughs) When the male perspective is the dominant one, 
The end point is women being coerced into sexually demonstrative behaviour in order to hold on to their careers. This idea repeated over generations can't but have a negative effect on women, whether they are in the industry or not. I needn't point out that these roles are interchangeable for artists and they are not prescriptive to all female musicians. For every chart-topping star that fits neatly into one or other of these archetypes, there are 20 other artists who may not have the same earning potential, but carved out their own roles as human beings, not objects. One has only to look at Julia Holter, Haim or Polisa to see strong women unrestricted in their art by their gender or sexuality. Throughout the industry, wherever you find women, they are doing brilliant things. Trina Shoemaker is a three-time Grammy Award-winning engineer. Mandy Parnell is a mastering engineer who has worked on some of the best-received albums of the last 20 years. And Marin Alsop this summer became the first ever female conductor of the last night of the proms. She recently said, There is no logical reason to stop women from conducting. The baton isn't heavy. It weighs about an ounce. No superhuman strength is required. Good musicianship is all that counts. As a society, we have a lack of comfort in seeing women in these ultimate authority roles. Out of 295 acts and artists in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, 259 are entirely male, meaning that Tina Weymouth's part in Talking Heads makes them one of the 36 female acts. The Association of Independent Music's 2012 membership survey revealed that only 15% of label members are majority owned by women. PRS claims that only 13% of writers registered are female. The Music Producers Guild, less than 4%. Last year, I toured with an exceptionally talented female sound engineer. And last week, I launched a publishing company that unintentionally has all female staff. Honest. Unintentional. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm constantly disappointed to find out how, many, how few women there are working in certain areas of the industry. So, is it simply all down to sexism? Myths about women perpetuated by men? Nicki Minaj seems to think so. In what has now become known as her pickle juice rant, she talks about how she is derided for demanding a certain level of professionalism with the people she works with. She says, When I am assertive, I'm a bitch. When a man is assertive, he's a boss. Minaj is one of the many top-flight female artists who use alter egos in their work. Her other personalities are often men who rap violently about women. So, to what extent are these myths about women perpetuated by women themselves? In a very recent, very public spat between the legendary Sinead O'Connor and the infamous Miley Cyrus, Mother O'Connor wrote a concerned open letter directed at Miss Cyrus, who herself responded by ridiculing O'Connor's bipolar disorder on Twitter. If women are to become free agents of their gender's destiny in music, in a music world where, which is reliant upon shouting loudest over the clamour, it stands to reason that online pissing contests only serve to detract from the strong messages being put forward by such artists as Janelle Monet and Erica Badu. Their recent collaboration on Q-U-E-E-N is an eloquent and impassioned rally cry for what Monet identifies as everyone who's felt ostracised and marginalised. And yet it is women that she addresses most specifically in the track ending with the line, Electric ladies, will you sleep or will you preach? The recent flapping about Miley Cyrus's blah, blah, blah has clearly struck a chord with the likes of O'Connor and opened up a worldwide debate on the use of female sexuality to sell product. Annie Lennox cut to the jugular when she talked about the age propriety of what she calls dark and pornographic music videos. She has called for videos to be rated as films are, with X ratings being applied to the most sexually explicit. It is interesting to note that anyone of any age has been able to watch Christina Aguilera's simulated masturbation in her dirty video on YouTube since the website began. And yet you must sign in to the site to prove your age if you wanted to watch Bjork's stunning video for pagan poetry. Whilst I would argue that neither videos are acceptable viewing for young eyes, I know which one I'd rather have to explain to my child. Whilst channels like YouTube and Vimeo have a responsibility in dealing with these issues, radio stations shouldn't think they are beyond criticism. 
As Tony Hall, the BBC's Director General, announces the new iPlayer channel for Radio 1, the question must be asked. Should programmers take into consideration the image of an artist when deciding whether to play and promote their music? There are countless examples from the last few years of songs that have been in high rotation that have little to no artistic worth but are just plain rude. I've been asked to give some examples, but I don't want to give the Daily Mail an excuse to ignore the rest of this lecture. <laughs> BBC Radio is notorious for misreading sexual metaphor and innuendo as innocent, most famously with Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side. But more recently, there doesn't seem to be a decency barrier at all, unless you're dealing with words like fuck or shit or hippopotamus cock. <laughs> if there are no sanctions put upon music that is written so zealously about genitalia or uses soft porn in its promotion online, what is to stop artists feeling that making their videos and what well, their live performance more sexy, that's going to undoubtedly drive up their online views? and subsequently encourage more radio play. And so to Blurred Lines, which many in this room have no doubt added to their playlists. The Blurred Lines video, which had the biggest part in jettisoning a song by a mediocre artist into the biggest track of the year, was on YouTube for just under a week before it was taken down and remains on Vimeo without any age restrictions. The indefensible Robin Thicke stated in an interview with GQ that his intention was to do everything that is completely derogatory towards women because he respects them so much. He continued saying, people say, hey, do you think this is degrading to women? I'm like, of course it is. What a pleasure it is to degrade a woman. It is highly disappointing to know that the director of this video is a woman, Diane Martel who also captured Miley Cyrus's twerking for the first time in the video for We Can't Stop and is responsible uh, for an objectionable little number by Leia LaBelle, called, of all things, Lita. What is possibly more disappointing than this is the presence of the exceptionally talented Pharrell Williams at 2013's Round Table of Chauvinism. In a recent interview with Rolling Stone, Cyrus quoted a message to her from Williams, who said of her VMAs, blah, 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 the VMAs was nothing more than God or the universe showing you how powerful anything you do is. It's like uranium. It has the power to take over lives or power entire countries. Now that you have seen your power, master it. You are not a train wreck. You're the train pulling everyone else along. With this kind of encouragement, it is no surprise whatsoever that young women feel it necessary to be more and more shocking in their bid to be the most forward-looking? Canadian electronic artist Grimes, whose third record, Visions, was met with universal acclaim, says, I don't want to be infantilized because I refuse to be sexualized. To my mind, what this industry seems to want of its women increasingly is sex objects that appear childlike. Look at the teddy bears everywhere. The Britney Spears Rolling Stone cover with a Teletubby from 1999. I state again, Lolita? The terrifying thing is, the target demographic for this type of music is getting younger and younger. Jennifer Lopez seemingly trying to engulf the camera with her vagina on Britain's Got Talent earlier this year <laughs> is a mild example of how frequently carnal images creep into the realm of what is deemed okay for kids. But ultimately, it does not need to be like this. Sex can be art. Look at Bjork's Vespertine, a highly sexual and sensual record by a woman entirely in charge of her career and her sex. The same can be said about almost every Prince record, and should be. Both are artists, adults and human beings intelligently addressing a human subject, not exclusively a male one. I support Annie Lennox's plea for ratings on videos. If Rihanna had not grown up watching the videos of the 90s, then it might not be quite so essential for her to portray her sexuality so luridly, so constantly, and so influentially upon the next generation. If the power was taken away from sex in pop by making it harder for younger viewers to access it, then maybe the focus would shift to making works of artistic beauty and conscience. And fundamentally, that would actually be putting the power back in sex for a future world where humans are able to portray their sexuality as it is for them. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm Jane Garvey from Women's Hour on Radio 4. Now, Saturday's edition of our programme was a special all about women in music, and Charlotte was a guest on that programme and spoke very eloquently uh, about the issues, as indeed uh, she has again tonight. Um, Charlotte, tell me, was there one single moment when you felt you had to speak out the way you have done tonight? Uh, many times. I think uh, whilst writing this, I found it really difficult to sort of pinpoint specific examples throughout my career where I felt that, you know, there, there has been sexism present or I felt, you know, particularly sort of marginalised because, because of my gender. Uh, because it's so current, so often, you know, do you know what I mean? It, it sort of, it threaded its way through my whole career. So. Yeah, it's really fascinating to get, to get your experience and your insight because you were the innocent child star, mm -hmm. weren't you? And then, of course, inevitably, like everybody else, you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was, uh, as I said on uh, Women's Hour on Saturday, uh, there was a big clamour to sort of cover up my breasts as I was growing up because they wanted to keep me young for as long as possible. So, you know, there'd be often a couple of men in the room who'd be like, oh, she can't wear that top. You can absolutely see her breasts through that top. You know, you can have to put How something How old were you it. at the time? Well, you know, 13, 14, yeah. 15. It became more of a problem, obviously. Um, but uh, then it turned to sort of... Oh, you should get them out. You definitely, you should get them out. They look great. They look really great. So, uh, but uh, the one specific instance that I remember is um, doing the Call My Name video, um, in which I've got a basque and thigh high boots, and it's all pretty racy. And you were how old? I was like 19, and I, I, I felt massively uncomfortable with the whole thing. And I hadn't written that song, and I didn't even want to sing that song in the first place. That was a, a song that the record company wanted you to stick on the album. Yeah, and I'd never, I'd never have written Call My Name. I'd never have sort of believe it or not, sort of quite shy and retiring, actually. Uh, uh, but what's interesting to me is that you paint a picture, you slightly paint a picture of yourself within the music industry as this, this voiceless, um, a bit of a puppet. And in fact, what you've said tonight illustrates I mean, what we've heard from you in the last couple of minutes. You're not that kind of person. No one's going to tell you what to do. But also, I'm but 27. I'm 27 okay, right. now, you know, it's a different thing. Also, I think the thing that is important to remember, and in cases like with people like Miley Cyrus, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera... You know, all of those people were child stars. Now, you get a really skewed perspective growing up in the limelight. You know, there's not, there's not a hell of a lot of normality to grasp onto or even, you know, a perspective. You know, your perspective is something entirely different to what an ordinary girl of that age growing up would be. You know, you learn totally different things. It's so routine now. It's such, you know, if you're singing pop music... You're going to be scantily clad, etc. Rihanna doesn't strike me as being the kind of person who's not doing what she doesn't want to do. Uh, she, isn't she doing exactly what she wants to do? Well, apparently so. And uh, yes, the, I think the question is, the question that I sort of want to pose more than anything else really is whether or not uh, this is a cyclical thing, it is routine, whether the, these women, this is exactly how they want to portray themselves. Is it the right thing? Is it okay? For, the, for, for society as, as a whole, really. I know you've got two children, you have got a daughter. Yeah. Is this more relevant because of that? Not necessarily because I've got a daughter, because I've got children, because I've got a boy and a girl. I don't want my little boy growing up um, only seeing these unrealistic images of women and, you know, they don't really exist. Those women don't look like that in real life anyway. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I and do know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. so... <laughs> So, so, for, so for both of my children, you know, whether boys or girls, I, I just think that to be constantly, for that to be the mainstream and for those be the images that are sort of most associated yeah. with, with the mainstream, then, yeah. Here's a tweet or an email. I think this is actually from Islet. Uh, in the last four years, we've been together playing 100-plus shows. This is a band, Islet. Yeah, I, I know Islet. Um, yeah, music. we've worked with one female sound engineer just once. Gender bias isn't restricted to the pop world. So why are there so few women working and performing in experimental music? What do you think? <sighs> that's, that's hard. I don't know. Um, but I, and I actually think that there are a lot of women who are performing in experimental music. Of course, Bjork being the trailblazer, mm. who I mentioned twice within my lecture, because I love her. I just think she's incredible, and, and she, I think she is a massive role model for um, many female artists going into the industry. Um, on how to absolutely have a, a purity and, and a, like a purity of artistic vision, and but, then to see that through. Playing devil's advocate here, Bjork doesn't sell as much music as Rihanna, and yeah, um, absolutely. And also, more men, you're more young men buy music 
than young women. Yeah. So uh, this is about making money, and there's nothing wrong with making money. So what do we do about that? <sighs> I don't know. I don't have the answers. I just, I, you know, I just want to sort of pose the questions and hope that people talk about it and that more women decide to get involved from a younger age in order to solve some of these problems. But also I think that, once again, sorry, I keep coming back to this point, but because this over-sexualisation is routinely done, then I don't know how relevant it is actually in, in the, the actual sales of music or whether it's, it's just sort of we're caught up in this chicken and egg situation where you're not really sure whether that type of song would have sold. I know generally that, you know, sort of a bit of booty shaking does seem to aid sales and, you know, YouTube hits and whatnot. I was really interested to find out um, YouTube hits actually contribute to single sales in, in America, in the Billboard charts. They count. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't believe that. That's insane. Well, what's that going to mean for, well, we know what it means for the contents of videos, don't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, like, and it, like I said in the lecture, again, what's to stop artists saying, right, okay, well, I'm going to go... I'm going to go somewhere that you know, I may be totally comfortable with or I may not be totally comfortable with because I know that this is going to make me more money and it's going to, you know, but also, if that's your final goal. Yeah, there is an element of responsibility. Uh, Rihanna could actually say, let's stop this. Yeah. I'm going to wear a nice fitted dress for my next video. I don't know if she can now. Why can't she? I don't know if she can because she's in that pigeonhole. She's being pigeonholed by everybody else, by the media and everybody. That's what she does now. But also, that's what her record company are going to expect. So if she turned around and said, I don't want to do this anymore, I would imagine that they would have a massive problem with that because that's what has worked in the past. Don't change the formula, for Christ's sake. This is a struggling industry. You know, you're, you're, she's one of the, the, the artists that make the most money. And with, with the greatest respect to you, you can afford to say these things and to make the music you want to make now yeah. because of the money you made in the past doing the rest of it. Absolutely, but it wasn't because of taking my clothes off. It was because of being an angelic child star. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Pia Yezu. <laughs> and I, and I, th I thought you were fabulous, I should say. Um, I really think you've been fantastic, powerful, and it's brilliant to hear all this stuff from someone like you with all your experience. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thank much. you very much. Thank you. BBC Six Music Podcasts. Download for free at bbc.co.uk/slash Six Music.